Hello and welcome back to Corpse Factory. Let's continue. Did you miss me? Nah, just glad you haven't bit the dust yet. <laughs> That's so sweet. Tomo leans in close to me, almost uncomfortably so. Listen, have you had any trouble with Corpse Girl? Nope, I think I'm in the clear. Hmm. Well, I guess the time marked on the photo has long passed. Maybe you really are safe. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, though. Eh? Thanks for what? For thinking of me. Ah, shut up. Tomo's face is glowing red with embarrassment. Despite our differences, our interactions regarding Corpse Girl have helped us bond a little. I'm not counting on Tomo and I have a lot and I having a lasting friendship. Even just quiet peace might be expecting too much. I think it's in Tomoe's nature to want to pick fights with people, regardless of whether she's close to them or not. I wouldn't be surprised if we end up quarreling again, no matter how much we learn to respect each other. I'm at my desk if you need me, but don't bother me, you know? She waves and leaves that cryptic statement in the air behind her. I return my attention to my computer and mark a few tasks on my list as completed. The next person to waddle up to my desk and interfere with my work is Shinya. You weren't in yesterday? Nope. Are you well? Yep. Okay. Um, I've been meaning to speak to you about Sato. Ali? Yes, um, the thing is, I'm kind of in deep water because of her not showing up to work. And then resigning immediately. I was supposed to talk to you about that, actually. It kind of slipped my mind. Oh, right. I'm sorry, Shinya. It's my fault, really. I hassled you to get Ali a job. No, no. I didn't exercise due diligence. I really should have made her come in for an interview. Or I should have spoken to her myself to see if her heart was really in it. You should have. Hmm. When you put it that way... I'm not trying to be callous, but what he said makes sense. Listen, you couldn't have known it, but Ali struggles a bit day to day. I'll just say she has some anxiety issues and leave it at that. Anxiety, huh? Don't tell anyone I said that. I was under the impression she's been doing a lot better, but maybe I was wrong. I guess we all have our hidden struggles, right? Right. If only he knew. Then again, maybe Shinya struggles too. Maybe dating Tomo is his cry for help. Maybe he's going to snap one day and come into the office with a knife. Or maybe he'll discover Corpse Girl's website and request Kotomi Ida's death in retaliation for ending his career. Who knows? I can't read this guy as well as I initially thought. For the longest time I was under the impression he had a crush on me, so what would I know? Anyway, I hope Sato feels better soon. Maybe she'll find a job that suits her one day. Maybe. Uh, say, seeing as we're friends now and all, would you mind if I ask you a, uh, personal question? That depends on what it is. It's related to, uh, intercourse? My face scrunches up at the word. I don't like the direction this conversation is heading in. Uh, shouldn't this be something you talk to your girlfriend about? Uh, Yes, you're right, but I can't actually speak to her about it. You're really the only other friend I have, so... Genius' face takes on a dark expression that's far more depressing than what he just said. I feel bad for the guy. Um... <clears throat> well, what's the question? Oh, uh... If, hypothetically speaking, if someone pressures you into, uh... You know? We all know you're talking about yourself, Shinya. Sex? His face turns red in an instant. Yes. That. If someone pressures you into it and you really don't want to do it, what should you do? Say no. Firmly and loudly. No one should make you do things you don't want to do. Uh, yes. Uh, of course. I feel that my answer didn't give Shinya the comfort he's obviously seeking. Is Tomoe pressuring you into going all the way? No, of course not. She would never. I... never mind. 
It was foolish of me to bring up this topic. I'm really sorry, Noriko. Please, forgive my lack of professionalism. Shinya bows to me deeply, his face parallel to the floor. He quickly turns and scuttles away before I get the chance to say anything else. What was all that about? Could Tomo be pressuring him? I wouldn't put it past her, but something doesn't feel right. She seems really smitten with him. Would she really push him like that? Maybe it's guilt from not being able to prevent his career going down the toilet, but I feel like I should try and do something to help him. I watch Shinya get on the elevator, and once the double doors close, I get up from my desk and scoot over to Tomo's workstation. Hey, can I have a minute? Uh, this is weird. Normally I come to bother Yo. Yeah, sorry. Um, have you and Shinya ever gone all the way? Huh? We've only been together for, what, a week? You think I'm some sort of slut? <laughs> hey, don't answer that! <laughs> Look. Not that it's your business, but... No, we haven't. Shinya's sweet. He's old-fashioned, you know. He wants to really get to know me before we go down that road. And I'm happy to wait. The last few guys I dated only ever wanted one thing from me. And that gets old real fast, you know? Hmm. Okay, I believe you. Why are you asking me anyway? Did Shinya say something to you? No, I was curious, that's all. You think we're real friendly now, don't ya? Well, I don't mind some girl talk. Come talk to me anytime. Thank you. I'll do that. Tomoe waggles her fingers in a goodbye wave and I return to my desk. If I take Tomoe at her word, which I find myself doing increasingly often, then she's not trying to get Shinya to do anything he's uncomfortable with. So that can only mean one thing. Someone else is pressuring Shinya. But the guy admitted to me only today that his only friends are Tomo and myself, so... Who was he talking about when he brought up the subject? His superior, of course. I'm a little worried that I haven't received a news alert for an obituary today. My latest victim, that twin woman, had her photo timestamp set to 9am, 9.01am this morning. If my method worked like it has the last few times, then she should be well and truly dead by now. She should have slit her own throat or someone mysterious should have come along and slit it for her. It's not like I've managed to identify how Corpse Girl's power works. I'm no closer to figuring out why her victims die. All I know is that they do die. And yet, I can't find any matching obituaries for the day. I've tried searching manually too. I can't always rely on my automatic filters to get it right. I've scoured every source I can find and have come up with nothing. It's possible that she hasn't killed herself yet. It's possible that she's planning to do it. Or maybe someone else is still plotting to kill her on Corpse Girl's behalf. It's also possible that this time my victim won't die. Depressingly, that puts me back at square one. My winning streak will be over before it really begins if the corpse photo has no effect. I make a mental note to discard the burner phone when I get home. I somehow forgot to get rid of it on my way to work, being so absorbed in my strict morning routine. But it's not too late. Barely 24 hours have passed since I sent out the photo. I'm not straying too far from my modus operandi. Yo, you came. Mad. That familiar, halting voice snaps me out of my thoughts. Kojiro stands before me, wearing slightly cleaner clothes than the last time we met. It's very possible that he interpreted this meetup as a date and decided to wear his absolute best outfit. The smell of the morgue is only faint upon him, thanks to the desperate cover-up scent of strong cologne. Hi. Can I sit? Please. Kojiro pulls up a chair and sits across from me. He's relaxed and awkward all at once. His tall, lanky form doesn't really seem to fit in with the tiny, cozy cafe he selected as our meeting point. Waiting long? No, not really. Great. Ordered yet? No. What do you recommend? House blend. Fantastic. They roast it here. Also, the chocolate gato is amazing. I'll order two slices. Thank you, but I'm not hungry. Coffee is fine. He's ordering those two slices for himself, you know? Roger that. <laughs> The waitress eventually comes around and Kojiro places our order in fluent French. I think the waitress is taken aback as she bows politely and humbly asks him to repeat himself in Japanese. Yep. 
Once our order is settled, Kojiro leans forward and looks into my eyes. You wear glasses? I subconsciously reach a hand to my face and check if I am indeed wearing glasses. Of course I'm not. No? Why would you say that? Kojiro leans back, casually and shrugs. Couldn't remember. Maybe you had them on last time. Last time? Is he referring to when we met at the library? I've never worn glasses. Sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry. Just make a conversation. This place is great, right? It's true that the cafe possesses a quiet, comfortable atmosphere. The smell of freshly roasted coffee lingers in the air and the display of various cakes at the front counter doesn't make me ill. I can make out the faint sound of acoustic music in the background with vocals in what I presume to be French. All in all, it's a nice place. Kojiro cho chose well. Oh, uh, is this place expensive? I just don't have much money, that's all. Don't worry, it's on me. How's work? The bank, right? I cock my head to the side. Did I ever tell him what I do for work? I don't recall saying anything on the subject. Um, I work at the head office for Temujin. Not in an actual bank. Not so. Huh. Read your profile wrong. I relax somewhat at his explanation. Of course he would have read my noise profile before meeting up with me. That's pretty normal. I don't keep much personal information on there, but it's true that my works my workplace is listed. Our conversation is put on hold as the waitress returns with two cups of coffee and a single slice of chocolate gâteau. The cake is delicate and moist, and my stomach growls in betrayal of my convictions. Kojiro thanks the waitress in French, and she once again bows in embarrassment and takes her leave. Goodbye. He scoops up a section of the cake with his fork and holds it out to me. I wave the hand politely and shake my head. Oh well. He takes a bite and looks immensely satisfied with his choice of dessert. Could eat if you wanted. There's skin and bones. Excuse me? Just saying. Could stand to gain some weight. The nerve of him. Who would say that to a young woman? I'll have you know that I eat perfectly well. Think- Whoa. Sorry. Wasn't trying to be mean. You're gorgeous. Just saying. Some cake wouldn't hurt. <laughs> I'm gorgeous? I feel a little flushed and I look down at my phone to avoid Kojiro's warm gaze. Try the coffee, please. I reach for the cup in front of me, more due to the pleasant aroma than Kojiro's suggestion. I take a sip. It's been served at the perfect drinking temperature and it's absolutely delightful. Rich, delicate. I could drink this all day. I've probably been wasting my time drinking canned coffee. This is the real deal. Thoughts? For the first time since Kojiro arrived, I smile. It's wonderful. Right? I like your smile. This guy is really lay laying it on thick. I didn't come here to be swooned. Still, the praise is kind of nice, even if he's just trying to play me with the oldest lines in the book. I figure I should switch the subject to encourage him to stop flirting. So, how long have you worked in the morgue? Hmm, wow, good question. Okay, let's see. 34 now. Started there at 22. Damn, 12 years. Ah, never thought about it. Shit, I'm old. No, not at all. You're older than I expected, but really, it's no big deal. How old are you? Can I ask that? I don't mind. I'm 20. Phew, okay, right. Is that an issue? No, of course not. You're mature for your age. Or I'm out of touch. <laughs> You're out of touch. I can't help but giggle. Wow, okay. He laughs it off, but I wonder if it did hit a nerve. Would you date an older guy? And there it is, straight to the point. How do I answer a question like that? Good question. I've got no issue with age, but... I don't really know if you're my type. And if I can be honest, there is someone I have feelings for already. And so? Unrequited love, huh? Something like that. Hmm. Props can't compete with that. Well, that's okay. I mean, you're stunning. Out of my league. Throw to be friends of nothing else. Friends sounds nice. Mad. He raises his coffee cup in a toast, then takes a sip. Maybe I had him wrong. 
he might be a bit more mature than I give him credit for. If he can take rejection without pressing the point, that speaks a lot about his character. So, corpse girl. Hmm? Interesting, right? How does she do it? The photos, the killings, all without knowing the Vic's name. <laughs> yeah. Wonder what her death count is. Three. The four of them lucky. I try not to say this aloud. Hey, Chihanada. Car crash. Was it planned? Got the brake line. Drugged. Hmm. I have no idea. Sorry. Uh, but you requested his death. Uh, yes. I did lead him to believe that. I'll have to continue to go along with it. And for no personal reason? That's right. Brutal. Don't request my death, okay? <laughs> we'll see. Hmm. His face lights up, almost as if he's impressed with the ambiguous answer. Excited, even. Maybe I should try the sight. Request the death. Know anyone who deserves it? Sorry, not off the top of my head. Hmm. Me neither. Maybe you should request me. I'm dying to know how it goes down. You know, maybe you shouldn't mess with this stuff. What if you really ended up dead? Eh, I can protect myself. I mainly want a corpse photo. How does she do it? Oh, by the way, you read that book I gave you? You mean Strange Flower? Bingo. I'm halfway through it. Wow, fair effort. It's long. Thoughts? Hmm, it's interesting. I won't lie. Now, Bell Sinclair is a sicko, right? Right. He's not all there. Halfway through, huh? So, has he dined with the dead? Yeah. Who was it? Mm, his school teacher, I think. He dug up her body two days after she died and then dressed her in his mother's Sunday best. <laughs> yeah. Took the corpse out for Italian? <laughs> I can imagine the waiter's reaction. Ah, classic. Poggio seems to really enjoy reminiscing about the book. The story is definitely interesting, but the way he's laughing at it makes me a little worried. Then again, the guy works in a morgue, so maybe the whole scenario is just comical to him. Oh, that's it there. It takes me a second to realize what he's pointing at. Sure enough, the book in question is sticking out of the top of my bag. Pass it here. I want to show you a funny passage. I nod and reach for the book. I pull the massive tome from my handbag with a fair amount of effort. The book comes free, but it snags on the back zipper and causes some of the contents to fly out. Whoa. A few personal belongings fall to the floor with a clatter. I notice my lipstick, lip gloss, notepad and pen hit the cafe's tiled floor. Kojiro comes around to my side of the table and helps me pick up my things. He pauses when his hands grapple with another book that has fallen underneath. Strange flower. Was photography? Huh? What's this? I quickly reach for the book and try to snatch it from his grasp. It's nothing. Kojiro is quick and he instinctively avoids my desperate grab. He holds the book aloft and continues reading the cover. Huh. English? A comprehensive history of photo manipulation. He returns to his seat and flips through the pages as I finish packing my belongings away. I bow my head silently, waiting for his judgment. Yo. You can read this? Only a little. Oh, this is tough. My English isn't good. Thought it was French at first. Oh, these images. Kojiro suddenly snaps the book closed and looks at me. I figured it out. I brace myself for his inevitable accusation. Corpse girl fakes the photos. The photos aren't from the future. Like that was ever possible. Photo is fake. Timestamp is fake. He's correct, but will he go back to assuming that I'm Corpse Girl? Hey, why do you have this book? Um... I mean, you can just say I wanted to find out more about Corpse Girl and photo editing, I suppose. Are you editing photos? I mean, I have an interest in it, but that's all. Hmm. This book is old. Doubt the techniques are useful anymore. Still, it's interesting. My theory. Thoughts? About Corpse Girl faking the photos? Bingo. I don't know. Sure, it's possible. But 
Can anyone fake a photo so realistically? Realistically? Do you know her photos are realistic? Uh oh. Thinking quickly, I snap back with an answer. You sent me that copy of Eiji Hanada's corpse photo. Hmm. The one Corpse Girl apparently produced. True. It was good, right? Pretty convincing. Very convincing. Is photo manipulation that good? I suppose if someone skilled enough was doing it. Stop praising yourself. If it's not photo manipulation, then one more theory. What is it? Maybe the subject in the photo is a corpse. I'm confused. Of course it's a corpse. What's your point? Sorry, uh, hear me out. It's a photo of a real corpse. Just not the victim's corpse. Corpse Girl acquires a real corpse, dresses it up, just like in Strange Flower. She makes it look like the Vic. It's convincing because it's real. No photo manipulation. Huh, I see. You're close, now you just need to mash up your two theories and you're pretty much there. Immediately my mind starts to kick into high gear. Kojiro has unknowingly presented me with an unprecedented idea. What if Corpse Girl does get real corpses? What if she dresses them up, wounds them, makes them look like a carbon copy of the victim? Then she holds a photography session to capture the magic. The realism will be amazing. It will be way more convincing than manipulating a photo, even though I've become pretty good at that. It will be the next step up in realism. It's sure to convince victims to kill themselves. If Corpse Girl's victims can be relied upon to kill themselves, then I don't have to continually question the cause of death. I wouldn't need to worry about whether some mysterious third party is wandering around, slaying people on Corpse Girl's behalf. All of the deaths would be caused by suicide. It would be predictable. Conquering victims would simply be a matter of forging a convincing enough corpse replica. But the legwork involved in acquiring corpses would be... That's it. The answer is sitting right in front of me with a smudge of chocolate cake on his chin and an empty coffee cup resting in his hands. Say, hypothetically, would it be easy for Corpse Girl to even have access to dead bodies? Legal ramifications aside, could she possibly have a source of cadavers to desecrate at will? Mm, yeah, it's not impossible. Take someone like me. I have the morgue. I'm there alone, mostly. Someone like Corpse Girl makes me an offer? I'd give away spare corpses, no problem. Of course, I could get busted. It's not about losing my job. I'm not going to prison. The price would have to be right. But that's just me. Employees in other morgues, well, can't speak for them. Interesting. So you would willingly work with Corpse Girl if the price was right? Yeah, I've said it before. Big fan. I support her work. It's fascinating. If she really is using cadavers to make photos, then, well, I'm offended she didn't come to me for help. <laughs> this is amazing. I never imagined this meeting could be so lucrative. If I want to get my hands on all the corpses I'll ever need, I can just ask him here and now. I find myself breathing heavily and I notice that my cheeks are warm and my head feels slightly airy. It all comes down to whether or not I really want to step up my game. The way things are, while the twin woman, my latest victim, doesn't seem to have given up the ghost, maybe I'm being impatient, or maybe my work just isn't as convincing and powerful as I want it to be. Then there are the cases of the previous victims. Akane Tsurumaki killed herself, there's no doubt about it. But Eichi Hanada? It's highly possible his car wreck truly was accidental, I may not have had a hand in that after all. Ruri Hatano, my first ever conquest, the cause of her death still eludes me. There's no way she could have killed herself in the position her body was discovered in. She's the whole reason that I started suspecting someone else's involvement in the first place after all. So there's one definite suicide, one potential murder and one death that was an accident, a traffic collision that happened to coincide with the date I wanted the victim to die. Statistically, there's no way to know how Corpse Girl's power actually works. It's almost like deaths are just caused at random, and when you pile in the countless failures I've encountered over the past year, well, my success ratio isn't very impressive. If I could truly compel victims to simply kill themselves, then it would take the guesswork out of the whole thing, that's for sure. 
Progero's help. I could acquire cadavers and make them look like my victims. The work would be completely different to photo manipulation. There will be gore involved, no doubt about it, and it'll take a steady hand, some makeup artistry and access to clothing, props. Then there's lighting to consider, and backdrops. It's one thing to take an image from the database of the deceased and have a corpse splattered on a pavement ready to go. It's an entirely different thing to have to drag a body out of a morgue and plant it in position then take photos of it. There will be a lot to consider here, it's not a decision I can make lightly. And on top of that, I doubt I have the courage to right now to ask Kojiro straight up for his help. But, if I do go for it, I'm absolutely positive it will lend a massive amount of credibility to Corpse Girl's mission. The extraordinary realism will pave the road ahead of me with blood. Yo, finished your coffee? Oh. I quickly take a sip and drain the cup. That was delicious. Thank you for treating me. Very welcome. Shall we head off? Yes, let's. Any plans for the night? Yes, sorry I can't hang out longer. No problem. I had fun. Rogero stands up and conjures his wallet. He leaves a few bills on the table and then steps towards me. I stand up too and, playing my best hand, I quickly lean forward and plant a soft kiss on his cheek. The maneuver is surprisingly difficult thanks to his height and I don't think I pull it off as gracefully as I'd planned. Oh. Thank you for the date. Will I see you again? I give him my best alluring look as I bat my eyelids gently. Y yeah of course. He slowly rubs his cheek with tender fingers, amazed that I just kissed him. Bye bye now. I spin and make a beeline for the exit. I hope my trembling legs don't betray me as I step out onto the pavement outside. It's not in my nature to try and seduce somebody for my benefit, so much so that my attempt at it has left me feeling rather queasy. I don't know if I pulled it off, but now that I've left the cafe, I can't look back to see what effect I had on Kojiro, if any. I cross the road and the shiver runs down my spine. I hope I'm prepared for what I'm getting myself into. June 6th, Saturday afternoon. The weekend is here, and despite my desire to stay inside my apartment with the doors locked and windows closed, I find myself at the mall shopping for a new phone charger. My current charger gave up on me at midnight, and now my phone is running dangerously low on life power. I tried plugging into different outlets, I tried plugging into my laptop, but nothing I did gave my device even the slightest amount of charge. I thought for sure I had a spare charger lying around, but I turned my apartment inside out trying to find it couldn't even find the right type in my drawer of burner phones. So either the charger has died, which is the best case scenario, or my phone has become faulty. I hope the latter is not the case, because I really can't afford to purchase a new one. Getting it repaired is out of the question. I refuse to hand it over to somebody for a day or two and go without it. So I'm hedging my bets on the issue being with the charger. If I can buy a new one, all my problems should be solved. This is what I tell myself as I scurry through the crowded mall, dodging left and right to avoid careless people trying to bump into me. I know there's an electronic store around here somewhere. Even a discount store will probably have a budget charger that will still fit my device. I just want to find what I'm looking for and get out of this place. As I blindly navigate the area, I think back to last night when I first noticed my phone was no longer charging. I had been browsing through the obituary newsfeed, searching desperately for any sign of my latest victim's demise. No clues came up. There were countless new obituaries, of course. This is a big country, and people die every day, but very few matched the description of my victim. The obituaries that did match had photos included, but none of them looked remotely like the twin woman. It was dead end after dead end. I might have to just accept the fact that this latest request will go unfulfilled. But accepting it makes me angry. Very, very angry. I find myself stomping through the mall more often than simply walking. A few people glance at me, but I don't pay heed. I wanted that woman to die. I wanted her twin sister to rejoice or despair at the fate that befell her own flesh and blood. I wanted her to feel the fear of seeing her own corpse in a photo. 
I wanted her to feel the cold and clammy hands of death tugging at her skirt, whispering to her, inviting her to spiral down and down and down and down and down. To spiral down and just die. To give up, to die, to spiral down, to die. To spiral out of control. I wanted her to die. I wanted her to die. I wanted her to die. Spiral down, down, down. Why didn't you die? Why didn't you die? My head is foggy, my senses blurred, my face hot, my hands cold. I repeat the mantra through gritted teeth. Why didn't you die? Why didn't you die? Why didn't you die? I fall to my knees and scream at the top of my lungs. Probably not a smart thing to do in the middle of a mall. Ah! Why didn't you die? Why didn't you fucking die? What the hell? Damn, she's having a full meltdown. Damn. Can we get a security guard down here, please? Die, 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 die. Is she going to kill somebody? Mom, I'm scared. <laughs> I'll kill her. I'll find her. I'll find her. I'll find her. I taste blood in my mouth. My tongue is numb. My teeth chatter. I'll find that twin bitch. I'll find that twin bitch. I'll find that twin bitch. I'll kill her myself. I'll kill her myself. I'll kill her myself. I'll kill her. I'll kill her. All right. That's enough. A strong hand pulls at my shoulder and my face hits the ground. Hard. My arms are restrained behind my back and all I can see in my blurry vision is the checkered tiled floor of the mall. You're coming with me! My limp form is tugged backward and my head lolls to the side. I shut my eyes and let the blackness envelop me. A stinging cold ice pack bites against my cheek and rudely awakens me from my stupor. I don't know where I am. I don't remember why I'm here. But the sudden chill spreading across my face is nice, almost soothing. I realize that somebody, a tall man, is holding the ice pack, ice pack to my cheek and he motions for me to take hold of it myself. I reach a sluggish hand to grab the ice pack and continue to press it against my skin. The man walks around the chair I'm seated in and stands behind a simple wooden desk to face me. You can imagine my surprise when I recognized you. Oh, hello there. Huh? Opening my mouth in an attempt to talk causes a dull ache in my jaw. I apologize for treating you so roughly. The only reason I haven't called for the police is because I want to give you the opportunity to calm down and explain yourself. This guy, I know him, but from where? Oh, of course. It took me some time because I'm not used to seeing the security uniform. This is Kenji Ogawa, the very same guy who lives in my apartment building, the nice guy who greets me in the stairwell. The father of sweet little Momo. Mr. Ogawa? Ah, so you aren't completely out of it. Where am I? This is the mall security office. You caused quite a scene, Nariko. A scene? Hmm, you don't remember. Well, give it some time. I'm sure it'll come back to you. I try to think hard about the circumstances that led me here. I remember something about visiting the mall to buy a phone charger, but I don't think I ever found the store I was looking for. Some kind of anger or fear or something, some familiar primal emotion got the better of me. Listen, Nariko, I've always thought you were a sweet girl, and Momo looks up to you, you know. Please, tell me that you're just not feeling well. Please tell me the things you were screaming aren't true. The things I was screaming? An image of a smiling woman flashes in my mind. A twin woman with beautiful features and lovely hair. The victim, the one who didn't die. That's right. I remember now. I lost my cool. I became so overwhelmed with frustration that she didn't die. I must have broken down and unleashed my anger he here, right in the mall. Stupid, 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 stupid. This is all because I went outside. I went somewhere I don't normally go. I'm usually fine about going to the office. It's familiar. 
convenience store is fine too. In fact, my whole meticulously planned morning routine rarely bothers me. But the shopping mall? What was I thinking? I haven't been keeping up with my medication. Even if I was on top of it, going somewhere out of my comfort zone is always a risk. I need to start regulating my intake. Taking a pill or two every other day or when I feel like it isn't going to help me. Skipping days at a time and just popping a few in my mouth when I need to leave the house isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. I need to follow the guidelines. I need to keep a strict schedule of when I take what. Damn it, Noriko. I'm supposed to be calm at all times. Stoic, unflinching Noriko. What the fuck am I doing? Noriko, you still look a bit flustered. Do you want to lie down for a bit before talking to me? No. Okay. Well... Do you want to explain what happened? No. Huh. I never took you for a troublemaker. Please, Nariko. I'm begging you. Don't make me call the police. You were screaming about killing somebody. You were... manic. You can't just act like that in public. You scared a hundred people just trying to make their way through the mall. You scared me. A knock at the door causes Kenji to flinch. Ogawa, may I enter? Ah, oh, yes. Please come in, Mr. Fujikawa. The metal door is separating the security room from the real world opens with a screech. A broad, intimidating man enters the small room and displaces all the air inside. I feel like I'm going to suffocate. This her? Yes, sir. She's calm now. Indeed. The man, who seems to be some sort of detective, looks me up and down with a sour expression. Miss... Your name? I don't answer him. I see. Sir, if I may, this is Nariko Kurosawa. She's an acquaintance. Is that so? An acquaintance? Well, that speaks volumes about your personal life, Ogawa. Sir. Leave us be. I wish to talk to her. Yes, Mr. Fujikawa. Kenji bows, his grim smile cracking under fear as he exits the room. The detective, or whatever he is, towers over me. He pulls out a badge from inside his jacket and flashes it at me. My name is Fujikawa. I'm a detective, an investigator, for the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Department. You must understand that we take death threats very seriously in the police force. Huh? Excuse me, but Kenji said he didn't call the police. Kenji? Ah, Ogawa. Well, never mind what he said. I was here already in regards to another case. I happened to witness your little outburst. Ogawa was kind enough to allow me a moment to interview you personally. That's Japanese person. That's a Japanese English accent. Right. So, what do you want to talk about? Listen, if I were in your shoes... I dropped the sardonic act. I have reasonable grounds to arrest you here and now. His voice drips with pure venom. This guy isn't joking around. I squirm a little in my seat and I remove the cold ice pack from my face. Now, Miss Kurosawa, would you please explain to me who you are threatening to kill? A wave of dread washes over me as the reality of my current situation starts to sink in. If I don't fly straight and narrow here, I might be in for a world of trouble. I mean, to be honest, I think... I mean, I'm not 100% familiar with Japanese law, in and out, but I think if she just told the officer everything she did, corpse girl would be over, of course, but I don't think there's necessarily any breaking the law in what she had done. Though that might be a little bit of a grey area. I apologize for my actions. I wasn't feeling like myself earlier. I regrettably skipped my medication recently. <laughs> the medication excuse. I'll play along. Were you hallucinating then? No, sir. Not exactly. I need to come up with something and quickly or I'm not getting out of here anytime soon. See? I recently had an altercation with a co-worker about a guy we both like. The detective rolls his eyes at me. Go on. I guess I was a little upset about our fight, and really, we're actually quite good friends, so... 
I think a combination of that and missing my medication caused me to get a little too upset and say some things I don't really mean. Mm-hmm. And how do I know you're not dangerous? Are you carrying any weapons, Miss Kurosawa? Weapons? No, of course not. I see. Well, you're going to have to permit me to search your belongings. You understand that I can't allow you to leave until I have established that you're not a threat, right? The detective lurches forward and roughly grabs my handbag. Hey! He tears it open and rummages around inside. I'm somewhat relieved that I'm traveling lightly today. I even left the two books I'm reading at home. He finds nothing of interest in the bag, save for one thing, my phone. Hmm. He taps the screen, toggles the power button, and smacks the phone against his open palm. Is this broken? I realize that the last drop of battery power must have finally drained. I'm probably lucky for that fact. If he found certain things on my phone, I might be in trouble. It's not like I keep corpse photos on there. That's what my collection of burner phones is for. But there are certain things that would be incriminating if they fell into his hands. My noise chat log with Kojiro, for starters. And then there are those images of Aoi and Tomoe, that famous singer that had her phone hacked and her private photos uploaded to the net. Aoi knows I have her photos. She's okay with it. Tomoe... Tomoe doesn't know about hers. That would be hard to explain. What kind of photos are we talking about here? The singer, on the other hand, was part of a big scandal a few months ago. Probably half of Japan has seen her photos. Still, I'd rather keep my personal matters completely private. I don't want this asshole looking into my affairs. The battery is dead, sir. Where is your charger, then? I don't have one with me. He grunts and throws the phone to me, and I barely managed to catch it with my brittle, skeletal, clumsy fingers. Who'd have a charger with them anyway? Like, where are you gonna plug it in? Way here. I need to make a call. He leaves the room unceremoniously, and I hear the scraping shriek of a steel deadbolt locking the formidable door behind him. I breathe out and try to calm my nerves. I look down at the phone in my hand and see my mirror image counterpart peering at me in the black reflection. I don't look as good as I normally do. My makeup is smudged, which is strangely becoming more and more common for me. I think I've gained some weight. My gaunt face feels uh, seems fuller somehow, and my prominent cheekbones are softer. This girl staring back at me, she's not wholly familiar. Is this Noriko Kurosawa? Is this Corpse Girl? I look like some aberration, some sickening concoction of myself, and some person I don't fully recognize. I don't understand how I could have gained weight. I've been eating less. Maybe the canned coffee I consume religiously contains more calories than I realize. I'll need to cut down immediately. A sour taste rolls around on my tongue and I swallow it reluctantly. I feel ill at the sight of myself. The steel door swings open and Fujikawa stomps in like an angry toddler. <sighs> well, the priest claims you don't have a prior record, Miss Kurosawa. That's good news for you, I'm sure. But it's a fucking pain in the ass for me. I flinch at his apparent anger and recoil slightly in my chair. You're free to go. However, I remember you. Another incident like this, and I'll have you in for a psychological assessment faster than you can blink. I can do nothing but nod as a wave of relief washes over me. <sighs> get your things and get out of here. Oh, for the love of God, go eat something. You look like a starving child. Fujikawa spins on his heel with force and once again leaves me sitting alone. I take a minute to collect my thoughts before picking up my belongings and shoving them into my handbag. As I leave the security office, I spot Kenji standing outside the door. He bows his head meekly. Take care, Noriko. Yeah. He doesn't lift his head as I walk away. So much for stoic, unflinching Noriko. Remember stoic, unflinching Noriko? This is her. Weak of flesh and weak of will. Weak, weak, weak. Noriko can't control her emotions. Noriko can't face the world outside without the help of peppy pink pills. Noriko, Noriko, Noriko. She keeps calling herself that. I keep calling myself that. 
But I'm more than that. More than her. I'm corpse girl. I'm bigger than the frail body before me. What do my looks matter in the grand scheme of things? What does my ego matter? I want to be beautiful, thin, gorgeous. Kojiro called me gorgeous. It made me feel good. But that doesn't matter. None of it matters. Corpse girl matters. She will succeed and the world will continue to spin. I need to gain weight or lose weight. I need to look like Aoi with her small frame and cute features and that bust that's too hard to look away from. I need to look like Tomoe with her fuller figure, her obscene fashion sense and those oddly beautiful eyes that she doesn't deserve. I need to look like Yuriko with her bad haircut, terrible piercings and trashy clothes. I need to look like Mother who is just like me and Yuriko combined but with vacant eyes that used to be sparkling and clear but now just glaze over whenever you try to talk to her. I need to look like Noriko with her dark hair and her intense gaze and her healthy acceptable frame. I don't need to look like this skeleton, this living corpse. I don't need to look like this physical embodiment of hunger and longing and lust and fear and stress and anxiety and uncertainty and ambition and exhaustion. Fuck you. I curse at the mirror and spit on my own reflection. Fuck you. I clench my fists until my nails dig and tear and pierce my flesh, letting blood trickle between my knuckles and drip down to the carpet. I don't want to be you! I'm better than you! I'm better than you! I'm better than you! But I am you. I am Corpse Girl. It's what I always wanted. It's that sense of belonging that I always sought. It's that feeling of home that I reclaimed after home was lost. After Mother moved and Yuriko got put on ice, and after I found this apartment that felt so strange at first. This is who I am. I love your hair. Your eyes. I love you. Don't ever leave me. Don't leave. I raised two fingers to my mouth and kissed them gently, then pressed them against the mirror. I love you. Don't ever change. Right, she's lost her mind completely.